a long tan raincoat, his dress shirt and tie underneath, a backpack, and a determined courage painted into his furrowed brows and stoic look. The young man knelt on one knee in the grass. He folded his hands and bowed his head, joining 600 others in a prayer as they prepared to embark on a day that would turn the tides of American history. He was uncertain, unsure of what the day would bring. In his backpack, he carried only an apple, an orange, and a toothbrush and toothpaste. He'd also brought two books, Richard Hofstetter's The American Political Tradition and Thomas Merton's The Seven-Story Mountain. The books were to pass the time, because no matter how all of this went down, he could bet that he would be spending the night in jail. Finishing the prayer, the mass stepped out onto the street, arranging themselves in parade formation. We might not be exactly sure what he was thinking at this precise moment. Maybe it was The Seven Story Mountain, an autobiography by the young Merton struggling to find meaning in a post World War II generation, stricken with existential crisis in a new world with atomic bombs. Perhaps he was ruminating on one passage in particular Quote, The more you try to avoid suffering, the more you suffer, because smaller and more insignificant things begin to torture you in proportion to your fear of being hurt. The one who does most to avoid suffering is, in the end, the one who suffers most. Whatever his thoughts were, alongside fellow activist Hosea Williams, the young John Lewis began leading the marchers down the street in Selma, Alabama, on March 7, 1965, at about 2.18 p.m. They were headed to Montgomery in a 54-mile march to protest the hard hammer brought down on efforts to register black voters, as well as the murder of Jimmy Lee Jackson, a young man who had been shot by a police officer as he struggled to stop them from beating his mother. But something stood in their way. Stretching over the Alabama River, the Edmund Pettus Bridge was raised in 1940, dedicated in honor of its namesake. Edmund Pettus had been a celebrated figure in Selma. Before passing away in 1907, the former brigadier general for the Confederacy served two terms as a U.S. senator. As the marchers made it to the highest point on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, the other side came into view. As Lewis once said, down below we see a sea of blue. Alabama State Troopers. As Gary May writes in his book, Bending Toward Justice, quote, state troopers wearing blue uniforms and dark blue helmets bearing Confederate emblems stretched shoulder to shoulder across the four-lane highway. Some sat atop horses that moved restlessly in place. Clark's personal army, bearing nightsticks, whips, and electric cattle prods, were there too. They were wearing tattered khaki shirts, mismatched pants, and helmets better suited for football games or motorcycle rides than police action. Some were also on horseback, carrying clubs as big as baseball bats. One special deputy had wrapped barbed wire around a rubber hose. As the marchers continued over the bridge, Hosea looked over at John. Can you swim? John turned his head to peer over the bridge and at the river below. No. Neither can I, Hosea said, turning his gaze back toward the troopers. But we might have to. After a back and forth between Hosea Williams and the commanding officer, Major John Cloud, Cloud gave the marchers a warning. To be detrimental to your safety to continue this march, and I'm saying that this is an unlawful assembly, you are ordered to disperse, go home, or go to your church. This march will not continue. The troopers began putting on gas masks. Then, the order came. Troopers here advance toward the group. See that they disperse. John Lewis was one of the first to be struck, taking a baton to the head and falling to the ground where he thought to himself, I'm going to die here. John Lewis didn't spend the night in jail as he anticipated. Instead, he spent it in the hospital, nursing a fractured skull, delivered by a state trooper bearing Confederate emblems. 
The violence was ruthless, but it was also seen on television sits across the country. Now, there's a long story on the legislative politics involved here, but all of it would lead to Democratic President Lyndon B. Johnson signing into law landmark legislation. Who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. A bill that we, today, are talking about again. We need to protect the sacred right to vote. A bill that would increase voter turnout among black Americans between 20 and 50 percent in southern states in only 20 years. A bill that would give black Americans the legal means to challenge the status quo. How long, not long, because no lie can live forever. The Civil Rights Voting Act of 1965. But in 2013, the Supreme Court issued a ruling that would deal a blow to the Voting Rights Act, defang it, and leave it up to a divided Congress to resurrect it. To feel the weight and importance of the Voting Rights Act and why it lies in comatose today, we need to understand that the VRA did not happen in a vacuum. The history of racism in the U.S. is a long one. But to understand how it still operates today, we must look at it through the lens of political power and how the Voting Rights Act occurred against the backdrop of a freedom promised in ink and bought with blood, but never fully delivered in practice. I'm Ty Wyckoff, and this is the Millennial's Guide to This Historic Moment.